we are constantly under scrutiny from the general public when we perform our work. Everyone wants new and well-maintained roads, but no one really wants the inconvenience that delivering them brings. This is especially true of work at night and on weekends. We do have detailed guidelines that determine when and how much noise we can make on our sites after hours and on weekends. But managing noise is not just about abiding by rules or guidelines, it's actually about managing relationships with nearby businesses and residents to minimise the impact on their lives from the noise that we make on our sites. So when you're working at night and weekends, stop and think before you start talking loudly, reversing your vehicles or dropping tools all about the place. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the people living and working near your sites so that you minimise the impact on these people from your work. I urge you to play your part. Hi, I'm Pete Cahoon and welcome to this examination of nighttime maintenance and construction works by the RTA and managing noise. With me is Jeff Miller who is a noise specialist with the RTA and together we're going to listen and take a good look at the challenges that face us when road construction and maintenance work take place after normal business hours. So firstly, Jeff, set the scene for us in terms of what is noise and why we have to worry about it and why it's an even greater issue than usual when it comes to nighttime work. Well, Peter, the first part's relatively easy. Noise is unwanted sound. Now, the reality is we're almost always surrounded by noise of some sort, but for the most part, it's tolerable and we can even often zone it out. The hum of a fridge, the, the buzz of a fluorescent light, that sort of thing. Yes, and in fact people living near major roads and even under flight paths will tell you that they get used to that sort of noise to some extent. And some of them will even say that they no longer hear the planes. Well that's true except from my experience when it comes to sleep time and that's part of what we're looking at here. Exactly. And that brings us to the second part of your question. Why is it important? A noise is an issue we should be aware of for any construction or maintenance project, but when you add night into the equation, we really have to take extra care. And in truth, it's not really just about disturbing people's sleep, but by definition, after hours means after normal working hours, and that means recreation and relaxing, as well as sleep for most of us. Well, that's true, and noise impacts extend beyond sleep disturbance to relaxation, listening to music or television, communicating, and this is important too, to study. Especially around exam time. Yes. Essentially, we break the effects of noise into two categories, amenity effects and health effects. And we've mentioned amenity effects. Uh, the health effects include uh, stress, sleep disturbance, high blood pressure and heart disease. Well, there are some pretty big ticket items there, Jeff. They are, and ones we need to be aware of and to know how to do something about. I'm guessing there's some legal regulations here too, Jeff. That's right. In 2011, the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage is the regulatory authority involved, and they may set conditions or even stop work if noise from a site is causing problems. So yes, we do have legal obligations to minimise noise impacts, but to my mind, equally, if not more importantly, we have a community responsibility to minimise the impact of our roadworks. OK, so that's noise defined, unwanted sound. Now to our next definition, of course, and that's night works. Here we're really talking about any work undertaken on Sunday to Friday between the hours of 10pm and 7am the following morning. On Saturdays and public holidays, it is any work undertaken between the hours of 10pm and 8am the following morning. Well, that brings us nicely to what you might say are the three focuses for night works noise management, and they are scheduling the work, informing or consulting where possible and minimising the impact. Jeff, why don't you give us a quick overview of them before we dig down deep into each one. Well, those three really do cover off just about everything we need to know. Scheduling the work is about looking at the work overall to see where the noise issues are likely to come from and scheduling around them. Informing or consulting is all about notifying people of the upcoming works, talking to residents about any issues they may have and effective complaints handling. The third, minimising the impact, is about avoiding unnecessary noise on site and indeed in the immediate vicinity. 
So let's look in detail at the first of our three focus points, scheduling the work. Now, no doubt this will vary from job to job, but I'm guessing most roadworks would have some noise issues. To find out all about it, I went out on site. I'm here with Troy Compton, and I'm here to learn everything about scheduling in terms of night work and noise management. Troy, take me through it. Well, the first thing on the to-do list when scheduling the work is to identify the types of equipment needed for each activity by its noise level. Sort of create a matrix of activity and equipment all ranked to noise level. Then we look at when, where and how long and often each activity needs to be undertaken. So at this stage we're looking at raw data X metres of concrete need cutting at Y decibels totalling Z hours and so on. Yes, and with that, we then look at our work schedule to see how we can fit the noises of activities into the schedule so as to create the least disruption for those people living nearby. What we try to do, of course, is plan the works to avoid having noisy activities after 11pm. Then we look at how we can split up those noisy activities. Can we break it into small tolerable chunks, like two half-hour blocks over successive nights, followed by two nights respite and so on? Mm. And I believe it's no more than two nights of work in a row outside any single residence. That's right. And what we can also do, especially on a project that is quite large, is shift the noisy activity along the length of the works. So two nights we work at one end and two nights we work at the other end. OK, so what other ways in terms of scheduling can we look to in order to help minimise the impact of noise at night? Because scheduling takes place in the planning stage, it's here that we can do a traffic plan. We look to things like traffic flows for trucks in and out of our site, not only when and where, but can we eliminate the need for reversing? And if not, plan to use non-tonal reversing alarms and so on. Hmm. Now, Troy, you've got a schedule that you've prepared earlier that we can take a look at, and on it we can see how much of what you've said has been put into practice. Now, before we move on, I think it's important to understand that not all controls are equal. So one of the things we do when scheduling is look at each potential noise issue and draw up a number of the options available for dealing with it. Like a hierarchy and then you work your way down the list qualifying the measures that are practical and implement the one that works best for the situation. Exactly. Take reversing alarms as an example. We have a number of options. Eliminate the hazard. If possible, we could remove the cause or source of the noise by eliminating the machine, task or work process. So, Troy, with reversing alarms, could that mean eliminating reversing altogether? Absolutely. That would be traffic management. Now, we might find it's not practical, so we move down the list. Substitute. Substitute the hazard with a lesser risk. Is there an alternative machine or technology? Yes. We could substitute broadband or non-tonal reversing alarms. Mm. And if that wasn't practical, just keep moving down the list through... Isolate the hazard use engineering controls and use administrative controls and that can include our more strictly schedule style solutions. Which brings us back to our schedule. As you can see here, not only are the noisy activities scheduled for early in the night, say concrete saw, 30 minutes between 8.30 and 9.30, but also the idea of respite. We don't see the concrete saw used again after the Monday until the Thursday. And then there's no work on the Saturday and Sunday. Well, Troy, that all makes sense. It's, it's been a pleasure. So, Jeff, if you will, sum up scheduling the work part of noise management for us. Rank the activities and equipment by noise level, determine where, when and how often and how long the activities will take. Then build your schedule so that the noisy activities happen early in the evening and, if necessary, spread across the schedule in short blocks with respite days. Now, that's scheduling the work. Now, to take us through the next point, informing or consulting on the project, I went back to the coalface where I talked to a regional communications manager. I'm here with Regional Communications Officer Jacqueline Smith. Jacqueline, am I right that first and foremost, informing or consulting on a project is about notification and listening to people's issues, seeing where we can be flexible? Well, both consulting with the community and then notifying the community are both crucial. Yeah. We can deal with most things if we're given the information. That's right. And for someone trying to sleep, an idling truck or even a shovel scraping on the asphalt can be the dentist drill if they have no idea how long it's going to go on for. So notify the people in the area possibly affected by the upcoming construction and that would include letterbox drops? 
Yeah, letterbox drops, the electronic visual message signs you see next to the roads, adverts in local papers, and then closer to the day, perhaps some door knocking. That's an important point too, isn't it? The timing. There's no point sending out your notifications too early or too late. Five days is far enough out that people can plan for it and indeed raise issues that we may not be aware of. OK, Jacqueline, that's timing. Now, what do we need to include in terms of information? It's about keeping it clear and simple with all the important information, including when, where and what is planned to happen over what period of time. In fact, we have a template and that's what we're looking at here. And as you can see, it lays everything out. Like I said, the what, the where and when. And then it moves on to more clearly describe why the work is being done and why it has to happen outside of normal hours. And that's important too, isn't it? Explaining why you have to do this work in terms of putting everyone completely in the picture. Most people are reasonable. And when it's explained up front that the work can only be practically or safely done after hours, they understand. Next I see is the timings, and like you said, it's putting a start and stop time. That helps. Absolutely, as well as explaining how many consecutive nights it will actually go for. And you go in here to explain the type of noise. I guess it's one thing to say there will be some kind of noise, but then if a concrete cutter starts up and you're struggling to put the kids to bed, that can be another thing. If it's unexpected, yes. Now finally, there are contact details that includes complaints, but before we move on to complaints handling, that contact number is an important part of the communication process because if we're talking about consultation, it has to be two-way. Or at least the opportunity for it, yes. And that means having knowledgeable people at the other end of the number who can respond quickly to requests for information or to clarify any issues. To avoid frustration and angst. The last thing you want is to get people offside before you even start because any goodwill you need will soon run out if the community feels their concerns aren't being addressed or worse, they're not being listened to. Mm. So when you talk of door knocking, it's not just about door knocking to inform but where appropriate, door knocking to discuss and negotiate different issues. Consultation is about involving the people that are likely to be impacted. So yes, that's an important part of the process. Bottom line is, let people know what's going on. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Here we are on site at a typical maintenance job that what I can see is in close proximity to a number of residences. I'm with Anna Cook, who's the project manager on this job. So Anna, we're underway on a night work site and the phone rings. What do we do? If we've done everything right in the lead up and we're sticking to the schedule, so what we said we'd do when we do it is accurate, then hopefully these will be at a minimum. Having said this, it's really important that if any complaints do arise, then they are handled quickly and fairly. That means by someone with knowledge and authority that can speak plainly to the issues and has the power to do something about it if the complaint needs action from the team. So I presume this person who's answering the phone and, 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 and dealing with the complaint has a sound meter? Not necessarily. It's best to start out by listening and getting a handle on what the problem is and looking for some common sense solutions. If a sound level meter is out, it usually means that things have gone beyond talking and looking at simple ways to resolve the problem like relocating equipment or noting to staff to keep the noise down. Okay, so is the key to handling complaints listening, letting the caller know that you understand their point of view? Yes, our experience is that more often than not, simply listening and then explaining clearly how much longer the noise will continue and what measures you are taking to minimise it, it will go a long way to settle most issues. That's great advice. So Jeff, sum up informing or consulting on the project. Give detailed and accurate notice of the proposed work and any predicted noise issues to all potentially affected people and do so in a timely manner, not too early and not too late. Open lines of communication early and respond quickly and knowledgeably to any requests for information. And finally, respond quickly to complaints. And make sure they're handled fairly and by someone with knowledge and authority for the site. Okay, and that brings us to our final point, and that is minimising the impact. This is where the rubber hits the road, quietly. To find out more, I went onto that road to see how we avoid or reduce noise on the job itself. We are back out here on our night maintenance job, and again I'm with Anna Cook, the project manager on this job. This time, Anna, take us through minimising impact. 
Minimising the noise impact can be broken down into two parts. Avoiding unnecessary noise and I guess what we'd define as mitigating or reducing where possible that noise which is unavoidable. Well that makes sense. Let's say we look at the first part, avoiding unnecessary noise. Avoiding unnecessary noise includes things as simple as not shouting on site. Yelling for someone across the site might not seem like such a bad thing, but it's easy to forget that people are trying to sleep mm. and that shouting might be the thing that burns up the last of any goodwill you will have. Everyone on site is required to undertake a site induction during which they're instructed to keep unnecessary noise to a minimum and not shout or swear on site. Everyone on site is issued a portable UHF radio which is used for communication. And I've seen exactly that, workers coming together so they're not yelling at each other. So, voices down, no shouting and no swearing and it could be heard off site. Exactly. And while it's not an issue in particular for this project at this stage, we need to look at things like not slamming vehicle doors or leaving vehicles idling outside residences. Mm. So and what about where to park or stage vehicles? Absolutely. Why park outside a residence if there's a reserve a little way down the road? Now, of course, we're always encouraged not to drop tools in terms of OH&S, but that relates also to noise and nightworks, doesn't it? It's about awareness, thinking twice before tossing your tool into your toolbox, even from a small height, or maybe shoveling gravel instead of using a broom, that sort of thing. Mm. And being aware that for you it's, it's work hours, but for the neighbours it's sleep time or relaxing, or they might be studying. And simple things like what we're talking about here, putting tools down, will make a difference. You can imagine the racket of some of these tools clanging down on mm. each other or the road surface. During the day, it's not something that we would encourage, but at night, it becomes a noise issue. OK, that's avoidance. What about mitigating unavoidable noise? Mitigation is where we take steps to reduce the impact of noise that is unavoidable. Here we are looking at things like choosing equipment that is silenced or low noise. For example, this is a low noise generator rated to 65 decibels. Now let me ask you this, Anna. Do you take the supplier at their word or do you need to check it yourself? Trusted and known suppliers, you get a trust thing happening. But then again, when you've worked on sites long enough, when a silence generator starts to wear, you can tell by ear. Then it's worth getting the meter out. So not only silenced, but well-maintained equipment too. Yes, and those are the things that we need to get on top of in the planning stage initially, in terms of specifying the right machine and then checking it up on site. And I guess checking it, it's the right one when it's delivered to the site too. 10pm is no time to be checking that the, that the light that they delivered is the wrong one. And that can not only lead to complaints, but can shut down a job. Now reversing alarms, I'd imagine, is a common cause for complaint. Yes, and these days we can use broadband or non-tonal reversing alarms or where possible manage traffic through the site, so reversing is unnecessary. Now these trucks have to reverse, there's no getting around it, so what's the solution? We can't avoid the reversing, so we've fitted them with quackers. The constant beep beep of reversing alarms can be quite intrusive, so by adopting quackers we've reduced what was in this instance an unavoidable noise mm. source. Because the trucks have to reverse and you need some form of warning system because of OH and Exactly. Now placement's another issue, isn't it? The nature of this work means we don't locate machinery in one place for any great amount of time. But on projects where there, that is the case, then we need to plan where we should locate noisy plants. Can we put it at the far end of the site? Or is there something that we can put between it and the nearest houses that might reduce this noise impact? Mm. So looking at minimise and mitigation, we have to think about ways to avoid unnecessary noise. Things like shouting, slamming doors, idling engines and even dropping tools and materials. Then we go to doing what we can to mitigate unavoidable noise through selecting silenced machinery and think about where we can locate that machinery so it's away from residences or at least not in a direct line to them. Yes, it's a mix of planning and then thinking about those living nearby when you're on site. Anna, it's been a pleasure talking quietly to you. Well, that rounds out the big three. I'm back here with Jeff Miller. Jeff, if you could sum up the issues when it comes to noise and nightworks, what would you say? Well, there's a few general points that I think are worth revisiting. The first is that noise management is not just about decibels, but about relationships. Yeah, by the time the sound meter comes out, things are on a downward curve. 
and that means paying real attention to our three issues. Scheduling the work, informing and consulting on the project, and minimising the impact. OK, so there you have it. When it comes to night works noise, remember, scheduling the work, informing and consulting on the project, and minimising the impact.